What kind of music do you like? Someone asks you. It's an innocent question with an increasingly difficult answer. You try to respond nonchalantly. Oh, you know, Nina Simone, Pavement, Migos, Graham Parsons. You keep in mind the importance of citing groups from diverse cultural groups and genres. Heaven forbid if you only liked a single genre of music. In days gone past, you heard of people making sharp distinctions between different sub-genres of music. Punks and prog fans, or mods and rockers, or sectarian tribes like that of Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland. You feel above that. If you turn on Triple J, you might hear a punk track, a rap track, an indie track, and some post-hardcore side by side. None of this seems too strange. How do we make sense of our music tastes? Are our tastes superior to our parents' more comparatively narrow tastes? It should come as little surprise to people that music taste is a reflection of social background. Like the way you dress or your accent, you can tell people a lot about you without actually having to put it into words. It reflects an idea of both who you are and who you want to be. The concept of taste is explained by the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu as one of showing off and acquiring cultural capital. That is, instead of using your financial capital to show off your societal status, you instead do it with your flawless taste. In Bourdieu's study, The Aristocracy of Culture, he surveyed people of diverse class backgrounds in 1960s France. The musical examples he queried subjects on were chosen according to his idea of musical taste. So, high taste, or legitimate taste as he called it, was represented by Bach, favoured by higher education teacher and art producers. Middle class taste was represented by George Gershwin, favoured by people like junior commercial executives. And low or popular taste was represented by Johann Strauss's By the Beautiful Blue Danube, favoured by people like manual workers. It's a pioneering study in how we think of taste, but it's now thoroughly out of date. We're no longer living in 1960s France, or a world where everyone listens to classical music. The taste divisions Bourdieu is hinting at are now lost on us. In the past, high cultural capital was shown through an appreciation of the high arts while excluding the low arts. This meant being to music whose appeal might come from its technical complexity and initial difficulty. An appreciation of Bach showed that you could afford fancy piano lessons, attend a certain kind of school, possibly university too, could appreciate the supposedly timeless greatness of an old master over some modern popular work. Strauss's By the Beautiful Blue Danube was like considered low taste, light classical music, as it's very catchy, but also, as Bourdieu says, it's been devalued by popularization. A hipster remark if I ever heard one. You likely know it from 2001 A Space Odyssey's sequence of the beauty of space light, or Homer Simpson eating ruffled potato chips in space. Bourdieu pointed out that people of low cultural capital were pragmatic in explaining their tastes. They'd point to things like the catchiness of the melody in its favour. People of high cultural capital, meanwhile, would look for abstract philosophical reasoning to explain their tastes. The music critic Carl Wilson explains Bourdieu's findings. What we've agreed to call taste is an array of symbolic associations. We used to set ourselves apart from those whose social ranking is beneath us. And to take aim at the status we think we deserve. Taste is a means of distinguishing ourselves from others, the pursuit of distinction, and its end product is to perpetuate and reproduce the class structure. So how have things changed since Bourdieu's study? To understand how modern taste works, it's important to look at critics, essentially the gatekeepers of taste. While rock music initially seemed like an attack on these ideas of high and low art, critics gradually came to reproduce these high-low boundaries in their own ways. Out with Bach, in with a Velvet Underground. Out with Strauss, in with pop. But in our postmodern times, taste categories seem to have become further complicated. Intellectuals earnestly discussed the social merits of Carly Rae Jepsen and Beyonce, artists that critics previously wouldn't have seen it in their business to touch. This has come from a philosophical shift in the aims of music critics. Essentially, there are two opposing schools of thought on the job of the critic. As music historian Michael Markham writes in his A Little Optimism for Tchaikovsky, is it the job of music critics to understand and continue to enforce the greatness of the gross fugue, a work whose impact was limited by design and whose cultural influence has been marginal at best, or to understand Rossini, whose music made up the soundtrack of millions of people across multiple generations? Should critics reflect the taste of the people or push them into new, difficult places? This shift in musical taste has occurred as many people have moved towards the latter school of thought, known as Poptimism. 
Optimism sees value in the music of the charts, in what people are actually listening to. It is a rebellion against the philosophy it defines as rockism. Khalifa Sanfei's 2004 essay, The Rap Against Rockism, one of the founding essays of Poptimism, defines rockism as idolizing the authentic old legend or underground hero while mocking the latest pop star, lionizing punk while barely tolerating disco, loving the live show and hating the music video, extolling the growling performer while hating the lip syncer. Poptimism was the backlash against this. It criticized the mythologizing these authentic old legends and pointed out they were not immune from the market force of the music industry. Haven't Pink Floyd and Nirvana sold more records than Taylor Swift? They argued that a great song could be made by creating a new spin on an old form rather than abandoning form altogether. The elitist ivory tower of rockism was also socially questionable with its focus on a canon of mainly white male artists. Cultural capital was something that only white straight men were able to acquire. The genres ignored by rockism were made by or associated with women, people of colour or LGBTQ people. Something about the concept of good taste seemed to mostly value a type of music that was popular with white, straight, male intellectuals. As this is the group with the most social power in our society, their taste is what we call hegemonic, a ruling or dominant idea. People aspiring to have their level of social power had to acquire this taste to get there. As society changed under the influence of civil rights movements, and accordingly criticism became less controlled by white, straight men, the music that was valued slowly began to change. As mainstream attitudes have changed towards women, LGBTQ people, and people of colour, so have our opinions of the musics that were once associated with them. Michael Markham writes, Left out of serious music writing in the 70s to 90s was disco, funk, hip-hop, soft R&B, and romantic balladeers. Chick music to rockists. The only women who counted being the few who rock. Poptimism isn't the only change in music taste, though. There's also an obvious leaning towards omnivorous music taste. Scanning Pitchfork's end-of-year lists will put indie bands next to heavy metal titans, R&B singers, noise weirdos, and techno producers. It might be easy then to think we've put an end to the snobbery of the past. Class is no longer an issue. Victory to the 99%. But as society changes, taste changes, and snobbery changes. As sociologists Mike Savage and Modesta Gao put it in their Unraveling the Omnivore, Some sociologists see omnivores as the new embodiment of contemporary middle class domination through their capacity to reflect and absorb previously opposed elements of cultural taste. The person rich in cultural capital has enough time to understand multiple genres, their songbooks, their cultures, their histories. They get to seem open-minded and sensitive to the cultural underpinnings of the inner city ghettos just as well as they understand the perils of rockism. Savage and Gare actually found the term expert suited better than omnivore because a considerable number of dislikes and avoidances are revealed alongside the enthusiasm. Those with high cultural capital were also better at articulating their tastes and dealing with the abstractions of genre. Experts were also more likely to treat music as an obsession in its own right. In this way, this is the hipster taste of modern times. That is, it reflects the taste of the college-educated, book-reading, podcast-listening music fan. The music fan who understands about things like subgenres and reads think pieces on cultural appropriation. Low cultural capital is now associated with people who merely listen to one type of music or who do not think greatly about the music they listen to. A light eclecticism of taste would show less cultural capital than the heavy eclecticism of someone who could afford to study music at a postgraduate level. Guilty. <clears throat> this eclectic taste shows its snobbery in that it reflects only those the contemporary left has empathy for while avoiding that one group it really struggles to deal with, the white working class. Very few people would claim to enjoy things associated with that group modern country music, professional wrestling, white rappers. The pitfalls of eclecticism become immediately obvious. This music taste has trickled down from critics towards the people and has now become the new hegemonic music taste. Now, to acquire high cultural capital, you have to emulate this group of critics and their tastes. Not that people fake their tastes, but that these tastes represent something appealing that people want to emulate. This omnivorous taste can then become restrictive in its own way. After all, any system can become restrictive over time. As with pretty much any revolution throughout history, what started as something freeing becomes its own orthodoxy. Critics of Poptimism point to the threat of Poptimists celebrating each and every pop release, something the music industry would love them to do. Saul Austerlitz, in his The Pernicious Rise of Poptimism, points to the threat of certain artists becoming critic-proof. 
with critics each trying to impress each other with how non-elitist their taste is. Of course, there are problems with Bourdieu's research and therefore the grounding of all this thinking. Each person and taste community is different, even if they conform to certain wide-reaching patterns. The complexities of mapping out what each person's class, race, gender, sexuality and education brings to their music taste is overwhelming, even if we could account for their own psychological and biological circumstances. There's a part of this that feels immediately depressing. After all, this describes me to a T. I spent a huge amount of time choosing the artist I was going to mention at the beginning of this, and have changed it several times. Part of us wants to fight against the system and remove the trappings of class that show off our embarrassing privilege. But, as Bourdieu himself states, there is no way out of the game of culture. We don't like to believe our opinions are socially formed. We like to believe in our own uniqueness, especially us hipsters who like to prove our difference from the rest of society. It's the disappointing idea there's no way to truly transcend your background and escape your roots. In attempting to do so, you're merely conforming to the form of rebellion that society allows you to take. In the end, understanding how your tastes work is just as important as learning how other people's do. Perhaps if we all understood this a little better, we could be a little more empathetic to the people we disagree with, something that would certainly benefit the harsh ideological chasms in our current world.